welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp, and I'm the executive editor of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining today's webinar with Vladimir Bakbonsky. We'll be discussing what, where, and how of polygot persistence. And all registrants today will a webinar will be entered to win a complimentary guest pass to our upcoming NoSQL Now 2014 Conference and Expo in San Jose, California, August 19th through the 21st, where you can meet Vladimir in person. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of uh, people that attend this session, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. Vladimir will be sharing his desktop, so if your screen goes to full screen mode, just raise your mouse to the top of the screen, and you'll see a menu bar drop down with an icon for the chat. And there is a down arrow on the right where you can click and see the icon for the Q&A section. As always, you'll send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Let me introduce to you our speaker for today. Dr. Vladimir Vakvonsky, the founder of SciSpike, is the founder of SciSpike. He has two decades of engineering experience with software and data technologies in areas such as architecture and design of mission-critical and distributed enterprise systems, rule-based systems and languages, modeling tools, real-time systems, agent systems, and database technologies. Vladimir has helped a number of companies, including U.S. Treasury, Federal Reserve Bank, U.S. Navy, IBM, Dell, HP, J.P. Morgan Chase, Nokia, Lucent, Norton Networks, General Electric, BAE Systems, AMD, and others to select, transition, and apply new software technologies. Quite the impressive list. Vladimir is published worldwide and, worldwide and is a frequent speaker, session chair, and workshop organizer at leading industry events. I know he is one of our top speakers at many of our conferences. And with that, I'm very lucky with him, to have him here with us today. And I will give the floor to Vladimir to get the present started. Hello and welcome. So I will be sharing my desktop. Uh, I'm uh, showing you some PowerPoint slides. We are going to do some uh, live drawing here. And in fact, I will start by sharing a story. Uh, this is a story of one of our clients. We have been developing custom application for them. Uh, this is a company that is dealing with uh, supply chain. So what we do in, um, in their applications is getting a number of files from their clients. Their clients are purchasing various things. Uh, it happens to be in the healthcare space. And uh, you have a file with a uh, lot of data. Basically, this file are showing what has been spent in various healthcare facilities. When we get this uh, file, then we first need to clean them. Uh, these files contain a lot of errors. There is a lot of uh, garbage that needs to be sorted out. And after we remove uh, the obvious junk from this file, that can be very large. And there are thousands of, of clients which are sending this file. And then figure out, so what are these uh, uh, products, actually, that uh, companies have been dealing with? So with the um, product system, happening here is we need to do some product identification. So it's better done. So the system that is uh, using a database of products, there are the products in the database. And then to match the product that um, has been mentioned with the uh, product that we have in our database. What is interesting is that um, in many cases, the data that we get contain errors. Uh, a computer, no matter how smart the algorithms are, cannot really figure out what is this all about. So we have people who have fancy titles, which are called data stewards, and are going to get the daily dose of junk files and information. We're going to filter it out and figure out that, for example, form, there is no such a thing. This is how it should be actually 3 a.m. as the flyer. This data steward. What is happening next is uh, we are packing that into the system that is doing analytics. So through this uh, analytics system, we can offer our clients uh, better products, cheaper contracts, and, and so on. Uh, at the end of all this, uh, we should get uh, some nice reports that uh, what should be the products the company is buying. 
Now, besides that part that you deal with very large volumes of data that are handled, like this is city reporting and intelligence. Um, there is no uh, strict real on demand uh, for that. Then another uh, part of the business, which is dealing with uh, the e commerce part. And there you have your um, typical applications with your shopping cart. Amazon, but uh, in, a, in a specific domain. So this is the e commerce system. And we are dealing um, where is we are still dealing with the product database, and also we have a, a need to keep track of what are all the different people and their roles who are involved in this purchasing. So relationships between uh, many parties in our system, and um, the buyers, there. And what's happening is that uh, they are behaving based on uh, some contracts that they have established. And uh, have some validity and discretion rules uh, that are used for purchasing. Now that uh, the same um, entity can play a role of a buyer or a seller, we have distributors, manufacturers, and so on. So what we would also like to do, we would like to keep track of these relationships so it should be some system that should uh, keep our master data management uh, with the relationships uh, between uh, different parties. So this is our party system. Uh, the application can get quite complex. There are lots of different challenges here. We are dealing, for example, here with uh, very large data. With our product identification. We have data that is uh, typically semi structured. With uh, our system that is dealing with parties, we have data that is uh, probably not so voluminous, but it has um, a great deal of uh, um, connect networking. So we are dealing with things like graphs that are different. Uh, um, uh, here with the e-commerce, uh, the standard thing that you are dealing with is the dealing session data. You put things in your shopping cart, uh, interacting with the application. And here, for you, database should be used for this. Now, the answer to this would be standard data. But we have the relational database that the database that we are running in our enterprise. So that is what we are going to use. It turns out that the relational database have a number of challenges. And if we inspect this uh, situation, that the relational databases have certain problems. And let's uh, uh, look into what are these problems and um, how we should we try to address them. So imagine if you are showing the relationship that we have between um, power and uh, capacity. And to figure out, all right, so how much do I need to pay for this things? I think that today, um, moving into the CPU power, really nicely, when we look uh, into our storage system, they are growing fairly nicely. And what I mean by that is, is that if you need, uh, let's say, four terabytes of space, I uh, pay two times more than uh, for two terabytes. So I have a nice number. Uh, we don't see that much progress in the clock rate, but uh, we have multiple cores. I can get machines when, with uh, many processors. I can plop a rack with uh, relays and have a nice in our scale. Now put uh, a relational database into this picture. Relational database is going somewhere like this. Getting the life is easy, but you are expected to pay more and more for your performance. So you can start with uh, a small database, maybe something like MySQL, and then you say, well, that is that is not uh, good enough. Uh, you may go to something larger. What uh, uh, you are going to say? Well, I need to use some Oracle system. I'm going to use maybe a DB2 
to have it up to a couple of petabytes. Stretch this uh, to even greater length, so perhaps you go here for something like Teradata. And a lot of a lot of money for your um, system. At one point, you are also dealing with the area that is basically out of reach of relational databases. Not this in a relational database. And this is what uh, we encounter in the web space, web applications with massive number of uh, users. The first kind that we have encountered that the Google, Yahoo, and so on. So what are we going to do? What would we like to do? So we have to achieve the following. We have to have a database. Then to have a nearly linear growth. We have to get what is flatten this curve. We need two times more the storage or two times better performance. I should be paying only two times more, not four or eight. And I'd also like to cover covering the ads I could not cover with uh, my relational database. So its cost is there is a third problem that you are trying to address, which is performance. Now it's out that a group of databases that are collectively known as the NoSQL databases are providing some type of answer in this space. Now the solutions are not perfect, but they are allowing us to move that we have with a relational database. So when we look into this um, uh, NQL stores, we are going to see uh, several different designs. Uh, one, and that turns out to work very well, is in settings is what's known as the key value. It's a very simple design in which we have uh, um, something that tools I'm crazy, sorry. So the key value store right. now. So we have uh, basically something that would uh, resemble a hash table. Keys could be anything, and you can imagine what would be very popular for for a value would be to have um, perhaps JSON that is going to contain uh, things like uh, what we have in our shopping cart. Have the content, and this thing what could be a good value for a key. Well, there would be some type of a session ID. Very primitive design, a very simple organization of uh, our functions. Um, and one thing that we have here is great scalability of this system. Now, today, come in two flavors. One, a uh, flavor where we start this uh, a large uh, volume of data. And this is basically what uh, is the typical organization of data for the Hadoop system. Whether uh, that, that the key values are stored in very large files, key some type of ID, and values typically a line of text, but the other uncharted information that we have in our system. The other sort of applications from the NoSQL store the, uh, follow the key value approach. And um, we have uh, a couple of representatives. One that is very popular in web applications is the system called Redis. And this is uh, very good for storing web sessions. You will have that uh, both keys and values will be kept memory. You get a rest, extra time, and, um, and then you also from uh, provide the ability to move your session information from individual web server to some, um, some area that can be shared among web servers. So this is one of the very common use cases. We have a number of web servers. And what is that they will store session data in a database. So, 
user who is accessing the system is going to interact. Uh, the data, the session data, will be stored in the database. So this access. Now, at some uh, point later, the user is accessing the system. Balancer figures out that uh, this guy is um, uh, too busy. The first server, our request gets uh, forwarded to the second server. The second server has the ability to access the database and grab the data. So very popular uh, way of interacting with of other systems out there, uh, Macache is a very popular system, caching layer, which is called the RIAC, which is providing persistent storage. But the essential thing here is that the data model is very simple. Two words, very much data goes in the Hadoop, into Hadoop uh, distributed file system, or we have a store that is typically I think things like um, uh, web sessions and similar information. So let's see value store. Either very large data store or they address the performance. Store that emerged is what's known as a columnar store. store. We are going to store the data in as a whole, most uh, databases today are storing data in rows. And actually, one of the founders of uh, relational databases said, you know, at the time in the 80s, when we were thinking about how do we store data, it was fairly natural. But it turns out it was not such a great, great idea. So there is a, a whole group of systems that can store data in columns. Now, interesting and different in things like this is that can have a very large number of columns in such stores. The system that can support over 2 billion columns. And this is interesting. Uh, the system also supports uh, sparse data, so you can have a lot of holes in your data. And they very efficiently. Uh, one of the early systems in this space was the system that was developed by Google. This is the Big Table system. And Big Table was uh, used in uh, various applications by Google. Uh, one of the most notable ones were to download web, store it in the database, index it, and so create the index that we are using when we're doing search. Other systems that are very popular in this space, uh, one of these systems is uh, Apache Cassandra. Andra is a columnar store. Interesting architecture. We store the information in a peer to peer set of uh, machines. We call them nodes. And they are connected with each other. So, what we have here is that the different uh, machines are all connected to each other. And they fill over and uh, uh, automatic peer-to-peer uh, -peer connectivity and fault tolerance. So to write the data in a node, the node is going to talk to usually two of its peers and store the data redundantly. Usually, uh, you can have uh, that, um, two that have your data fail in your language. So and the other system that is uh, quite common in this space is um, age-based. And this is part of the Hadoop ecosystem. And um, um, this system provides uh, for architectures. It is quite similar to Cassandra in many ways. There are the notable users of this system. We have Netflix that is running most of its stuff on Cassandra. eBay is uh, running HBase for its searches. And they're serving over 2 million queries per second. So great scalability, very good performance. And Systems are quite popular. Also, they have one uh, real characteristic, and that is that they typically have a very high read speed. And the fact that this system uh, don't need to read the data before they they write them to the desk. So, very good. We often.
can use it for time period data. And uh, whenever something happens, you can add a column that is going to contain the data. So you can go your entries. And so you have less than 2 billion of such entries, you are in good shape. If you have more, there are some architectures and designs that allow you to define your data model to handle even larger. Color store is the uh, popular form of um, a NoSQL store. And we are going to see now the most popular form, and this is the document store. Or you are going to take uh, something that is um, it is not a PDF or a Word document. It is just a set of data. It is usually in JSON. So you have the structures of your JSON data. So to put this in your database. Now, usually this type of databases do not require schema. So usual entries vary in that in their structure. And uh, systems like this end up being uh, very easy to use. They're very popular. Um, the most prominent system in this space is um, focused on great uh, usability. You have a system actually and have a commercial version that includes some caching systems, which is the highest. And enough, uh, you are going to see also some um, some of the traditional XML databases now competing in this space. For example, ArcLogic is uh, a very prominent XML store. So um, it is interesting that you can store a variety of documents with varying information, very easy querying. Definitely the dominant form of uh, not SQL store out there. Okay. So we are going to see one store that is very well where we have uh, nodes that are acted in many different ways. Nodes with uh, connections. And in a system like that, you might be interested, how do I get from one node to the other? How do I get from my node A to node B? And you get various paths. The path that will go like this. You have another path that is going to throughout. And this may have different costs. You can find various ways to these that are connecting this node. Is uh, called the graph store. And what is interesting about the graph store is uh, they can store a very complex uh, set of uh, relationships between the nodes. They are typically not working that great for storing huge amounts of data, but the other languages allow them to do very efficient over the graph and path and finding the relationship who is connected to whom. And similar. At the store, we have a couple of uh, products out there. Uh, one is the quite popular uh, Neo4j. You have um, an open source system which is called OrionDB. Orion is uh, interesting because it combines a great database for the uh, relationships, and then each of the nodes they actually act as the uh, document database. So a combination of connectivity of the graph and also storing documents. Uh, this is running on top of uh, either Hadoop or um, Apache Cassandra is the Python DB. We, because it is uh, sitting on top of our SQL system. Mentioning these different systems and products, I'm really not recommending one or the other. I'm just uh, uh, some of the typical examples also of systems. So this is the store. To finding uh, uh, relationships uh, between elements. And question now, this is the four kinds of NoSQL stores. When you use them, what are their characteristics when it comes to performance 
and uh, scale it. It's like that. So you can arrange them and classify them based on their characteristics. So if we do something like this, where we put the our vertical axis and uh, we put uh, the complexity of data on our horizontal axis. We arrange our uh, system. So, think about the system that is going to scale to maximum. Now, a fairly simple data model. What, what um, data store would do well there? What would be the key value store? And, and the particular realization that this would work well for us is going to be so this is a key value store, a particular implementation as Hadoop. So large file, uh, it is uh, not a real data if you want, but it's a processing system. But you with data in, in a very large um, volumes. If you're thinking about um, simple, actually, but a very good performance, not such good scaling, uh, then uh, you are going to see that there is the same representative of the key value store, but the one that is running memory. And this is going to be something like key value store that we have, for example, with Redis, or the database that is going to store the session data for web applications. So very good uh, performance. So fast, because everything is in RAM. But again, very simple model. That is uh, going to be in the picture is the columnar store. Columnar store is uh, not as scalable as Hadoop, obviously, but it can uh, still store very large amounts of data. And then our next chart. So this is the store of each base and uh, Cassandra. But there are a couple of advantages. You can have your data model better defined. That there are query languages. There are even SQL dialects that you can run on this. So no um, advantages. If you have such a huge volume of data, you may be better with the columnar store. But for convenience, we see in many applications, there is a database time that is going to be quite useful, and that is the document store. Document storing various uh, JSON JSON objects in our document store. Still so well as the columnar stores, um, they tend to be more convenient for use, starting web applications, um, great popularity among developers, systems like MongoDB, CouchDB, CouchBase, and similar. The document store does uh, scale as well as uh, columnar, but uh, it's still good for many applications. And then finally, the database that is dealing with um, great complexity, uh, such a great scale, is uh, the Grab database. And the Grab database, in their implementation, one um, the challenge, and that is, it is very difficult to split the group between multiple machines and still have efficient processing. So these are the challenges they have. So it's the Grab database. But other unique characteristics that a lot to perform on this graph uh, very, very quickly. So this is the hierarchy of uh, these systems based on the scale and of the complexity of data. So we in your application will be uh, depending on what are going to be your demands, what you need to have in your application. Now, we're thinking about the application that you have, the question is, so where is going to be your limit? So you may that your limit can be somewhere here. Limit for your application. If you're not below, then any of these systems could adjust. If you're by bar higher, you're going to find, well, if it's here, 
then we can do that. Let's have our columnar star that is going to cover my data. I could think of you, um, Hadoop, but probably may not like the best processing, but the document will be stretched. I made some effort in it, and um, I applied various sharding strategies, but I'm likely to get more headaches than uh, it is going to be worse. So we are always going to look for some compromise in this space, and you will find that no system is going to be perfect for a type of application. So now there's four different kinds of uh, stores. We have to apply the best store for its task. And if you are creating an application, maybe, uh, an application for our clients, we will deal with a lot of elements. So remember to introduce as our example for this is this application that we deal with different uh, elements. And in this application, we have um, some large data. So large Analysts that are dealing with the e-commerce system. And we have uh, their shopping cart. Data. And the e-commerce system. We have catalog. Have there. Uh, we have this data about our various parties that we are serving. So this is the um, dealing with uh, customers. Relationships. And this could be quite complex. So the same entity is engaged as the selling distributor and, and the buyer of something else. And then we have uh, also part of our e-commerce system with such a custom buying something in our system. Question for you. Now, in this type of application, or what kind of database is going to be the best technique for this application? Data analytics. We are doing very large amounts of data. And remember, from our previous picture, the system that handles the largest volumes of the data is going to be Hadoop. When you about the e-commerce part of the system, dealing with shopping cart, dealing with sessions, they're going to be well supported with some uh, key value store. So it will be some key value store that can store the ID of the user and uh, the content of the shopping cart is uh, in the value part of the record. Product is an interesting one. In product catalog, uh, entries that describe the product. And you go to Amazon and browse through this product, you will see every product is going to have, have some set of fields like name and the price, the manufacturer, and so on. But see that um, products are more and more getting additional descriptions. There are text documents. Um, sometimes you will have a PDF. Uh, sometimes even movies attached, many pictures. So the description of one product can vary significantly from the description of some other product. And we know for such a variability, type of data store is the best document store. Document store would be very well suited for the catalog. Yes. Basically, what we have there is a graph of relationships that combine and connect our different parties. And uh, you can think that the graph database will show it for that. And in fact, in industry, there are already some commercial offerings for massive data management systems for custom relationships that actually built on top of a graph database. And another question. Um, 
which is from these databases that we have seen is the best database for transaction. If you could, this is our old friend, a relational database. So a relational database is really fine when it comes to transactions, but other problems that are addressed uh, with this other database system. Now, if you look into this system, I've seen that uh, the non-SQL stores like Hadoop have great um, ability to scale. Uh, we have systems uh, like key value, in red that provides with great uh, performance, there are stores. Then when you run um, performance benchmarks, they tend to run faster than relational databases. Not so but in many benchmarks that will be shown. And where's the where is this coming from? Is there some secret? Well, there's a secret. So all these stores are going to make some compromises. And the most common compromises that is the in many no stores, oh, not many, there are no transactions. In stores, you also have that there are no joints. Changing the way how you are developing your apps. So look uh, into your uh, traditional way of development. Typically, find that you start uh, by looking into some use cases. Data model. A logical data model that is going to be really nice and elegant and you can answer various uh, uh, queries you have about your uh, data. In the database, you are going to store this. You think to have a data that are in a fairly normalized form. So most, you are going to use a very powerful and quite sophisticated engine. You are going to submit various SQL queries. And the engine is going to calculate at runtime what is the best way of accessing this data and grabbing them from the database. And then you get your answer. Now, what is interesting in this design is that you are creating this data model that is not turning at the particular use cases that you develop, but a, the model is allowing you to run queries about things that you did not think about when you were defining the use cases. So you provide SQL in an interactive fashion and explore different queries that you can do in this system. But then, is the best time to make answers for our use cases at runtime? Perhaps we could, we could, we could use all of that and uh, run it uh, faster in, um, in the production of the system. This is your standard relational flow. If we apply this to our NoSQL systems, we are going to see that the flow there is different. And we'll find also some references. Uh, uh, How deal with this um, data polyglot uh, So NoSQL stores, you are also going to start with use cases. You want to, what are the questions that you need to answer? But then creating a wonderful data model, you are going to create a model that provides answers only for very specific use cases that, that you have. But then it's going to be created a model that avoid all the joints. So to store everything as is in uh, disk, so you do some pre-computation and rearranging the data. So when read, there are no joins, nothing specifically needs to be done. You just can read the data. And if you do that, then you're going to get your uh, report. So it's very fast, the problem is that the system cannot answer any question that is not designed into the system from the very beginning. And this is one of the 
big vulnerability that you really don't care much about when you talk to NoSQL stores and, and polyglot resistance. In this setting, you must design your system for specific uh, use cases. To add a new use case that you think about from the beginning, you need to create um, a new data model. You will need to add to your database so that it's significant to the work. And not only that, if your use case interacts or modifies the data for use cases, uh, you need to make sure that you update the data in this other uh, data model. Uh, that you can create. So, one of caution whenever you start combining your uh, systems and working with not equal issues. The integration of this system. So, let's look at the following. Um, we, let's go back a couple of uh, pages and think about the, the following. So you know, when you are thinking of integrating your systems, have, um, our um, data this is from national sources. So super relational databases. So what we are doing here is uh, we are going to put into our relational database. Run here some uh, analytics, and then I think uh, uh, the results. Looking into variety of these non-SQL stores, I'm going to represent all of them just by uh, introducing an area here. We are going to put it in uh, potentially one or even several of different stores. For example, columnar and so on. And uh, then you can apply some analytics tools. Now, these analytics tools in this space are not as mature as in the relational space. They are coming, but far they are not so popular as uh, the conventional. So one of the critical elements that you would do in the um, polyglot resistance is may actually um, have a movement that will go from your NoSQL stores in the relational database. This is a very common, and we extract the interesting information from our NoSQL stores and uh, move it into the relational database. Now, we don't everything. We are just passing the interesting things, and then uh, we can use our conventional analytics tools. And this is actually an approach that works very well, easy to organize it in fact. Sometimes that there is a data movement that should happen in the opposite direction, so you have arrows that can go in both. Particularly the beginning, most likely you will be extending your relational stores and not equal so have a data movement back and forth. Now when we look into that picture, we're going to find that there is also one shift that we see in industry. And that is the introduction of um, microservices. The microservices are uh, one particular realization of service-oriented architecture, where you are breaking down your services into relatively small units. Some small applications can be around a thousand lines of code. So very different from the old school SOA where you may have a service that is near lines of code. The traditional approach in uh, such systems was to have one um, have these different services access the database. So we have services that are accessing the database. Imagine when you're running in the cloud, uh, it's rather problematic to find a place that is big enough to run our large database. So our large database is a big Oracle system, or DB2, or the Z-series mainframe. It's very difficult to integrate in the cloud setting. So in, in such a case, uh, we are going to have that our services typically on individual machines. 
that will be running somewhere in the cloud. And it is not such a good idea to have one very large machine or a mainframe that is participating in the cloud that is just running our database. So what would be a better architecture of choice is to have ability to run a number of smaller databases in this setting. Our service would have in the database that it will be accessing. And this data can be placed somewhere close to the service to achieve some benefits of the locality of access. And if you have this uh, several databases, you have multiple choices. So databases can be additional, but they don't need to be. For example, if you find that it is better to use a document database in an area, then you can uh, use it there. The document database here. You can have RAC database here. And you can have database here. And this is what you would do if you need to achieve the uh, maximum out of technical capability in terms of speed and performance uh, scale in a particular area. But now I want you to notice that we're introducing multiple databases. In our previous life, where everything was stored in a relational database, we have one headache. And the headache would be how do we make a relational database work well for all these different kinds of data. We have replaced this one big headache with more of smaller headaches, where we have problems in integrating these different systems. So the question is, how do we keep this system consistent? And uh, one of the approaches that you will find out there is that uh, you are going to integrate them using uh, services or using messaging or some type of streaming. So you keep the updates on uh, different systems. Uh, um, have an integration, but the typical techniques are going to be messages. Uh, various streaming mechanisms. In one of our systems, um, Apache Flume is uh, part of the Hadoop framework. Flume is enabling you to move data from one source to a number of different things using different mechanisms uh, at the level of abstraction. It is running in a transactional fashion. It's a very convenient way to integrate a variety of systems, relational, and Hadoop, and a variety of non-SQL source. So this is that you really want to cover in your system. So uh, one uh, detail is related to the software architecture when it comes to this uh, polyglot systems. is you avoid having direct dependencies of application to the database. So is you have some module with uh, business logic. I would like you to avoid going directly into the database and be dependent on your particular database. Instead, I say don't do this at work. Instead, you to have that is going to decouple business logic from a particular store. Have the data layer. And is going to provide the interfaces. We have multiple implementations. And one example of uh, how would that uh, look, look like if you are dealing with um, products. You have an interface. Okay, that is going to be used by our client. Here we have the API to examine different properties of the product. And uh, this um, interface is um, used by um, So we have clients here. We have uh, here another interface. It's 
The subject is of the standard patterns in um, enterprise software development. And the interesting thing here is that we are encapsulating the functionality to access the data. So imagine that we have, uh, let's say, a uh, um, data product implementation for the SQL code uh, that is going to Oracle DB2, MySQL, one of these. And over here, we can have the implementation that is going to go, for example, into the product. So when it's using our, our system, they are first going to access the product data access object. We'll be using this interface. And no call that they make is going to be specific to the particular database. What we have here is a nice way of separating the functionality that we are looking for, which is the accessing the product information from uh, the actual database that is uh, going to be used. So this aspect of SOAR architecture that is really critical for NoSQL. And that is always isolate your databases. You will have dependencies. And what can happen is that you would like to change from one database to the other. Now, would you like to change your database? So from operational point of view, you would like to do one thing. To minimize. Not of NoSQL source in general. Go to your uh, CTO and, and you tell them that while in this application we are going to use the relational database and the documents and the graph and the key value store and calendar store, the question is that really necessary? It may be necessary if you are going to push all of these to the extreme, there can have technical capability. But it could be that for your organization and your volume of data, it's perfectly fine to have a combination of your relational database, which you have, and you combine it with the document store. And this is enough. This is where you should stop. Uh, document database is not going to be optimal for other kinds of law. But it may be good enough for your application. And now you are dealing only with two databases. So, from the engineering point of view, you have to be reasonable and uh, try to keep the number of uh, different data stores to the minimum. But if these data stores cannot satisfy your uh, requirements with regard to scale of performance, then the time um, to then possibly extend and further. But only if Needed. See in practice that sometimes the architects uh, so fall in love with the different database systems that they will apply a whole range of different systems in the same application. My attitude would be to go easy on that and um, apps that are really going to make the difference, to minimize it, try to uh, minimize the number of, of uh, systems that you are dealing with. But please keep in mind that these systems have a lot of um, advantages over stores and over each other. And uh, you always evaluate the systems in your concrete environment. Uh, also saying that uh, you should never trust the propaganda materials of your database vendors, uh, but create specific use cases and tests that are uh, illustrating the way how you will use the system and benchmark the system in your specific environment. It requires some uh, work on proof of concept, uh, but just the literature. You have to try it out on your own. So um, how about the global resistance? You um, always um, try to find the best choice. It is not only a technical choice, but also operational. Uh, you should um, try to deliver a real tangible value for uh, your client. So don't uh, be in love with your store, but uh, uh, see how you deliver the value. And always uh, integrate with uh, existing systems. So at the end of um, my find some uh, um, hints on uh, how to do this. So the last slide uh, that we have, uh, 37. 
how to succeed with polyglot resistance. All the way, this is one of the critical things. Uh, the knowledge in this area is still relatively scarce, so make sure you either grow your um, champions or um, hire them. And the things are fairly volatile in this space. It's a future field, always new things. Every six months, uh, there is something really interesting that happens in this space. So always be on the lookout to uh, new and better techniques. Well, that's all uh, for our presentation, and um, I uh, I'm looking forward to your questions. Vlad, well, thank you so much. This is I just love the the live whiteboarding and, and interaction with the presentation. I, while attendees, I just want to remind you that you can enter any of your questions in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen in the Q&A section. And just to get us started, the most common question that we receive is whether or not you'll get copies of the slides. And Vladimir is going to take copies of the um, whiteboards that he created. So we will build that into the slide presentation and get that out to you within two business days. So by end of day Thursday with links to the slides, links to the recording of the session. And everyone is so quiet today, Vladimir. We're not getting any questions coming in. I think you answered them all. <laughs> What's the most common question you get, Vladimir, with uh, in terms of polygot persistence? Uh, this is a good question. So what is uh, one of the difficult things in applying this new non-SQL system? So one of the really interesting things is dealing with people. Dealing with turned out to be a rather interesting challenge. So uh, what happens in many organizations is uh, when you look into an existing data architect or a database administrator who has spent 20 years dealing with the relational databases, so there is this new technology. And they feel threatened. Um, with every change in technology, there is a change in power in organizations. So they are afraid that they might be uprooted from their um, position. The key thing uh, to successfully apply such polyglot systems is to reach out to these people and realize that this is not a fight against them. This is not a fight against relational databases. But this is something that can offload the, the type of load that is not ideally suited for relational database. Move it away from relational database to something else. That is the system uh, from doing uh, unsuitable work. Uh, this enables them to get the better performance. And uh, one of the key things in educating people is, is to that not this non-SQL system have magic in them. All achieve their advantages by abandoning something that is done in relational database. And most of these are transactions and jobs. Somebody uh, asks, so how do we run our systems with our transactions? Well, it turns out that this is something that we are doing that for a while in uh, SOI systems where the Transactions are very difficult to achieve because uh, you will need to tie together multiple systems and have transactions that run for a very long time. So what we do in such cases is we explicitly perform compensatory action. So we have to detect if we are on the right track, if there is a problem, if yes, then fine. If not, then we are going to execute compensatory action that is with us and that will restore the stable state of the system. One of the consequences of such a design is that we achieve much higher throughput. The design needs to be on the optimistic side, but then we can always handle uh, the problems as they occur. Um, here we okay, have we've got another question coming here. And, and of course, it starts with a compliment about a great presentation this has been. And the question is, are there particular use cases where you've seen Cassandra preferable to HBase? Uh, Cassandra and Angibase have a uh, rather similar architecture. They are both columnar store, stores. Uh, we have seen in the past in, in com uh, applications with our clients that Cassandra uh, was much easier to deal with when it comes to setup, when it comes to operations. Also, uh, there are claims that Cassandra will respond much better when uh, nodes fail. Uh, the failover is apparently smoother in Cassandra and it is easier to have undisrupted performance of the system. A uh, couple of things that uh, we have seen on the Cassandra side that resonated well with users is the existence of the query language, which is uh, very similar to SQL. Uh, that actually made the adoption of the system among our clients who are all very experienced database people 
uh, it makes them easier to work with the database. If you have to program, um, the API is simple yet powerful, but you really need to have a Java person that is uh, implementing this. There are some um, systems that are introducing additional layer of SQL on top of HBase, uh, but they don't seem to be so mature as what we see in some environments. Perfect. And I typically cut it off right at the top of the hour, but if you have time, Vladimir, we have one more question coming in. I typically encounter concerns about the concept of eventual consistency. Question. Um, so when it comes to eventual consistency, there is a misconception. So uh, where are the systems going to be consistent? Is this going to be a week or in two weeks? Well, the answer is that in most of such systems, the systems will become consistent in range of milliseconds. So in, in distributed uh, systems, we have seen range of hundreds of milliseconds is typically uh, the, the range. And then you can also adjust the, your application and then uh, also the, the needs of your application. If you absolutely need this to be consistent, you need to lock everything. Uh, if you can all based on your application that you can be 100 milliseconds or a couple of seconds off in your application, then this is a great uh, use case for eventual consistency. We do, we do have one more question, and I'm going to go ahead and ask it. Um, it it's a loaded one, Vladimir, and it's one that we get all the time. Uh, is there some modeling model for the NoSQL types? Excellent. So I think uh, model or the tools for the NoSQL types. Uh, I was actually looking in this area quite a bit for, for various applications, and I must say that uh, there is nothing that is really usable out there. Uh, several reasons. One is that uh, the systems tend to be so different. Um, also, the data structures that we have are uh, rather nested in most of the systems. So we didn't see any tool that is directly addressing them. But there are things that you, you can do. First, so when you're dealing with document stores, as, um, you can uh, introduce your data models for many of them and import JSON or JSON schema. Works rather well. It is full textual, unfortunately, but uh, practitioners, uh, particularly those who are coming from programming, really like to use this type of environment. So plain editor, uh, you will be defining the schema in terms of uh, uh, JSON. When it comes to stores, uh, like columnar stores and uh, graph stores, we don't see any particular tool that is uh, helping with modeling. So usually uh, we would uh, do a sketch on the paper or on the whiteboard and then we would go with the code. So unfortunately, not, not much graphics there. That's perfect. And I'm afraid that is all we have time for today. Vladimir, thank you so much for this fabulous presentation. Uh, just to remind everyone, we will be hosting the recording webinar slides on dataversity.net within two business days. And then, as mentioned, I will send the follow-up email out to everyone, so by end of day Thursday. And don't miss the opportunity to meet Vladimir and other fabulous speakers at our fourth annual NoSQL Now conference in San Jose, August 19th through the 21st. And thanks again for attending today's webinar, and hope everyone has a great day. Again, Vladimir, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to meet with everybody at the NoSQL in Santa Clara. Bye-bye.